Okay. So I got it. Okay. So this week we're going to talk about midrash. Did anyone read the essay about midrash? Oh. Yeah, of course. So that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Preston, I, yep. I want to say something. Yep. I actually tried accessing what I thought was the site you had, yep. you know, referred yep. us to, and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I don't know. Okay. So what you can do to access? Yeah. Uh, here, let me show you. Um, if you. Um, Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Yes. Here we go. If you and and Sheldon, I'll I'll share this for you online as well, so that everyone can see this. Um, so if you go to the uh, the homepage, our 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 website, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. And if you go to um, adult education, okay. which I can't see because this thing is in the way. Uh, if you go to adult okay. education, yeah. okay, got it. And you go to the class, walking with, right? Okay. So. Oh, okay. Here are the recordings, but here also are. The essays. Okay. I think you took us through this one time. Right? Okay. So they're all there for you as well. If you want to go to the AJU directly to find it the, the hard way, but the easy way is. That's what I think I did. I was the hard way. Is, is Barbara and, um, and um, Galene have made this easy for you by putting all of the, all of the things here. So this is Thank you. Right there. Just, just right there. In the weekly email, I noticed that because in today's email, about the classes, Barbara has a link and it takes you right to what the rabbi showed. So uh -huh. that's, that's where new. I normally oh, will that's go great. through oh. the link in Barbara's email because okay. it says resources for walking with right. God are right. here. Okay. And I typically so, just wow. there. So let me tell you a little bit about, about Midrash. Okay. Um, oh, and I should grab it. Um, so Midrash is named for what Rebecca does when she is um, in the woes of pregnancy and she's not feeling well and it feels like two nations are fighting in her stomach. And so she, she, she goes to inquire of Adonai and God gives her some context. You know, you have two nations in your womb and one will be greater than the other and all those sorts of things. So what Midrash does is it evokes an idea of directed search. So Midrash is you're searching and you're looking for this search and you're looking for it as looking for a response. Okay. And this idea of you're searching for meaning in the text, you're searching for having some response from the text. You want to find God in the text. Okay. So Midrash begins with a crisis, uh, both historically and the process of Midrash. So the crisis is the destruction of the temple. We need to get new instructions from God. That's the crisis that formed the, the, um, the basis for Midrash. But in order to do Midrash, you need to find some kind of crisis in the text. So you've got the text and something doesn't make sense. There's something missing. Um, there's something that the verb is wrong or the noun is wrong or there's redundancy and you want to go a bit deeper to figure out why that redundancy is going on. And so, you know, I, I gave the example at the very end last time, but I'll give it again. That um, God says to Abraham, Take your, take your son, the uh, only one of his mother, the one you love, Isaac, and sacrifice him on a mountain that I'm going to show you, right? So what's the crisis, what's the problem with this, with this text? Well, he's got two sons. Right, he's got two sons, okay? The crisis of the text, though, 
you're, you're already into the answer, right? The price of content <laughs> is, is, it could have just said take your son, or could have said take your only one, or take the son you love, or could have just said Isaac. Once you said Isaac, why do you need to say all the other things? That's redundant. So from this text, we infer, you know, the process of Midrash, what's the crisis of the text? It's got redundancy. And so what we do is um, we start asking some existential questions. So like, you know, how, what's going on here? So son, I have two sons. Each is the only one of his mother. Uh, love, I love them both. Isaac, okay, right? So that's like a little midrash going there. Yeah. This is why, I guess what you said before, why didn't he just say Isaac? Why didn't God just say, take Isaac? Why didn't God just say Isaac? Because God wanted us to supply this narrative so that Abraham looks like a decent human being. Right? Because Abraham looks like kind of a jerk because he's taking his son to kill him. But now we know that Abraham has love for both of his children, and that, and we and we talk about how, um, you know, why is it that God that Abraham negotiates over Sodom and Gomorrah, but with sacrificing his son, he doesn't negotiate. Well, here he's negotiating, right? So that's where we we pull in the meat. But Midrash is a human activity. It's the idea that we can find out more of what God wants by reading between the lines. Okay? With me so far? And so the essay gives some lovely examples of, uh, of how we bring human questions to it. We, and, and by bringing the questions, we bring God closer to us. Because now God is speaking to us right now from the text instead of just from the past in the text, right? Because it, it brings a current, okay? I, I, I have a question. Yep. So why do you think God uh, wants us to read, or thinks we need to read between lines? Ah, excellent question. So, um, I mean, God would seem to me to certainly yeah, have the no, capability no, no. Yep. to be very explicit yep. and clear. Absolutely. So, okay. Absolutely. So, okay. so, so here, so here's what it is. I'll give you an example of the midrash. <laughs> it's like a king who has two children or two servants, and to each of them he gives a bowl of uh, flour and a basket of flax. And then he goes and leaves. So what does the wise child do? He adds water and sugar to the flour and bakes bread. And he takes the flax and he turns the flax into linen and he turns the linen into a tablecloth and he puts a tablecloth on the table and puts the bread on the tablecloth. And the other son just puts it in storage. Now the king comes back says, okay, I'm back. Show me the gifts that I gave you. And the one son says, here's the table, beautiful tablecloth, beautiful challah. And the other son says, here's a basket of, uh, here's a bowl of flour and a basket of flax. Which one is going to find the favor of the king? Right? Normally you might think, you know, if I give you something for safekeeping, you just have to return it untouched, right? But if I give you something and you sell it and you use it to buy chickens and then you sell the eggs and then you get converted back to cash at the end, now you've given me interest, right? If I give you $500 mm -hmm. and you buy chickens and you harvest all the eggs and then when I come back you sell everything and you give me back $800, mm -hmm. I think you've done a better job of keeping my $500 safe, right? So. That's kind of like us in Torah. So in Christianity, God. Well, why do you think God even gave us those options? Well, I, well, here we go. Yeah. So no, no, that's a good question. Here's why God gave us those options. In Christianity, it's war. Right. In Christianity, <laughs> God's greatest gift is God's son. 
right? Yeah. And the sacrifice of God's son is so incredible. Nothing could ever top it. There's nothing we could ever do as human beings to give as much as that guy gave. So in other words, all you can do is accept it with love, right? But God gave us, what did God give us? God gave us Torah. And what can we do with Torah? We can improve on it. We can be God's partners in creation. Okay? Why does, why is the blessing for bread, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz? Okay? Every other blessing, you know, re pri ha'etz, fruit of the tree, pluck it. There you go. Pull it out. There you go. But there is no, I, I can't dig in the ground and get bread. There is no bread without human participation. And that's why bread is the highest of all of the blessings for food, isn't it? Right? If you have fruit and you have vegetables, you have meat. Okay, you're eating something. But if you want to say Birkat HaMazon, the blessing after having eaten a meal, you have to have bread. Just a tiny little bit, bit of bread makes the whole meal. Okay? Why? Because we've been partners with God in the creation of that bread. Okay? That, that's, that's, that's the notion. Okay? So Midrash is this... Um, way of reading between the lines and hearing God's voice, right? Um, okay. So let's look at a couple of, couple of Midrashim in action. And all of these Midrashim are all based upon more or less the same text, okay? So let's look at our first text. And let me bring it up on my screen. Okay, so our first text is from uh, Shmot Rabbah, and it's on Exodus 3.6. So because we don't have perfect memories, I mean, you know, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not Protestants here. You know, they could, if you say Exodus 3.6, they'll just give you the verse. I mean, they're amazing, those guys. They know the Bible. For, and, you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's, in, it's in Yitro somewhere, okay? You know? <laughs> You know, I can tell you which week we read it, but I, I can't tell you, you know, specifically the chapter and the verse. I mean, you have to be born again to do that. So um, I'm going to tell you what chapter 3, verse 1, um, verse 6 is. So chapter 3, anyone remember just vaguely what chapter 3 of Exodus is about? What's going on there? Give us a hint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chapter three is Moses at the burning bush. Okay, is that the snap? That's chapter three. Because chapter one is you know the history up to Moses, and chapter two is Moses being born and and ending up in in Jethro land, and then chapter three is okay intro, introducing God. Right. So Moses is tending the flock, and he is. Uh, there and he sees an angel the lord talks to him out of a bush and says here i am and we come to verse number six and here's what god says god says in verse five do not come closer remove your sandals from your feet for the place in which you stand is holy ground and then verse number six i am he said the god of your father the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob and Moses hid his face for he's afraid to look. So that is the, the context. This is Moses introducing to God, or God introducing God's self to Moses. So what does the Midrash add? So just looking at our verse, I'm the God of Abraham, I am, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What kind of questions do we have? What can I get rid of in that verse? Right. Right, right, right. I am 
the God of Abe, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, right? If I'm the God of Abraham, well, Isaac's God was the God of Abraham, and Jacob's God was the God of Isaac. It was the God of, so why do I need to add it? I should just say Abraham, because that's one who made the covenant. Why do I need all these? Right. Why do I need to express all those things? That, that's, that's what we're guessing is going to be our question, right? Well, let's take a look. Um, Arlene? Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Want... Yeah, read, read this. Okay. Uh, Rabbi Abba Ben Mamel said, God said to Moses, you wish to know my name? Well, I am called according to my work. Sometimes I am called Almighty God, Lord of hosts, God, Lord. When I am judging created beings, I am called God. And when I am waging war against the wicked, I am called Lord of hosts. When I suspend judgment for man's sins, I am called Almighty God, El Shaddai. And when I am merciful to my world, I am called Adonai. For Adonai is the attribute of mercy. As it is said, the Lord, the Lord, God, be merciful and gracious. Hence, I am that I am in virtue of my deeds. Okay. And then uh, Rabbi Isaac said, God said to Moses, tell them that I am now what I always was and always will be. This is the why, why the word again is written three times. Okay, so does this answer our question? Turns out no. <laughs> it answers a totally different question. I was going to say, it's telling God's different identities, maybe not necessarily about how God related to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Right. But God has attributes. Right. And there are different aspects of God. Right. And maybe that's also true then of uh, patriarchs. Each one has a slightly different attribute. That's true. Yeah. And, that's true. You know, and he's the God of all those attributes. Mm -hmm. And each patriarch had different relationship with God. That's right. right. Anochi, I am. Anochi, I am. Yeah. Now, did Moses know any of this? I mean, considering how he was raised? No, I don't know. I don't know what Moses knew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know what I mean? it's like, Rabbi? Yeah. <laughs> uh, doesn't the last sentence incorporate all that came before? Hence, I am that I am in virtue of my deeds. That really encompasses everything that came before it. Yeah, yeah, it, it does, it does. So what the Midrash is doing here is it's explaining, you know, why it does a simple question, what is your name, comes up with, you know, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, Moses hid his face, and God continued, I've marked the play of the people in, in Egypt, and I've done taskmasters, all these other things, right? But we're getting this message. Now, compare that to, so this is saying I am, and I am meaning I have lots of names. Now, compare that to the following, which is looking at Exodus 20, verse 2. So, Exodus 20, any guesses as to what that might be about? We just read it more, last week. Be more of whom God is, about whom God is. Okay. <laughs> Exodus, so if I want to have highlight points for like God's appearance in the book of Exodus, what are my inflection in highlight points, right? What's the highlight of human God relations in the book of Exodus? Okay, burning bush is one. Wait, Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is two. Very good. Okay, that's direct communication. Okay, and so Ten Commandments. So the first, so the second verse of uh, the Ten Commandments, or the second verse of, of chapter 20 is the first verse of the Ten Commandments, because the first verse of chapter 20 is just God spoke these words saying. You ready for this? Anohi, Adonai Lehecha, I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out from the land of Egypt? Don't have other gods before me. So, what's similar between uh, the verse in Exodus 3 and the verse in Exodus 20? What do they have in common? 
God is describing himself. I'm the God of your ancestors. I'm the God who brought you out of the land right. of Egypt. Right. Anochi. Right. Anochi. I am. Anochi. So, I'm the Lord your God. Last time we were told, I'm the Lord your God. I am, meaning I am all sorts of different aspects depending on what it is. Here's a different take on I am. And what's that take, Diane? Uh, I'm reading ahead, um, he has three different faces. Well, well, well read for us. Uh, I'm I am the up. Lord your God, mm -hmm. Hanayat or Papa said, the Holy Blessed One appeared to them with an angry face and with a neutral face and with a friendly face and with a smiling face. The angry face was for Torah. When a person teaches their son Torah, they should do so with awe. The neutral face was for Mishnah. The friendly face was for Talmud. The smiling face was for Avada Midrash. The Holy Blessed One said to them, even though you see all of these different faces, I am the Lord your God. Okay. Where are we getting these four faces from? Well, we did talk to, about other aspects in the previous one that, mm -hmm. that God mm -hmm. had, had other. But. So we have these two comments, right? One of them is on God at the burning bush, and one is God to everyone. They both start out anochi. In the first one, God is describing themselves, describing itself as the God of Abraham, the God of Ab Isaac, the God of Jacob. And this time it's, I'm the God who brought you out from Egypt, right? Not in relation to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, but in relation to you all. Okay, that's nice, right? Um, so they have these four different faces, right? Why four faces? Neutral, angry, neutral, friendly, and smiling. I'm not sure where they're getting that from. <laughs> yeah. But four different aspects. What do you think of this? That the, the angry faces for Torah, person who teaches their son Torah, neutral faces for Mishnah. Mishnah is just straight up legal code. Friendly face for Talmud. That's legal code that's been improved. And the smiling is for uh, Agadah, for Midrash, which is where we bring ourselves to it. Okay? So depending on what we're talking about, we get a different aspect. Yeah. That changes the interaction with you. Right. Why is the angry face associated with Torah? Okay, that so... Shows, I mean, that, that seems to indicate that I know that if you don't keep the Torah, then you're going to get pretty angry. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the Torah is, is things that, I don't know. So I think that, that you could put angry or you could put harsh. If harsh. you want it, that might work. But, you know, it, it's in black and white. That, that's what I would suggest. So the Midrash is, now first of all, either of these Midrashes, are they necessarily what is missing in the text? How much of this is creative on the part of the rabbis? Rabbi? Yeah. <laughs> um, didn't the Talmud come after Exodus? Yeah. But here it's in Exodus. Well. Historically out of place. Right. So that's the great thing about Midrash is Midrash can assume all sorts of things, right? Midrash can assume that um, uh, Abraham kept kosher. Midrash can assume that Moses studied Torah even before the Torah was given, right? And the Midrash can say this verse here, we're not reading it in the context of that moment, we're reading it as if it's happening right now. And 
we can also say that God was speaking this as if these things were already existing or in anticipation of these things uh, existing, or to even suggest that um, all of these things are implicit because we have a, a written Torah and an oral Torah and God gave us the written Torah, which is written down through Moses and the oral Torah was also given to Moses. So although the Talmud is not written down until thousands, lit, thousands of years later, what's in the Talmud, according to the rabbinic mind, was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Let's mull on that for a moment. <laughs> Let's look at the next text. So this is the Nechot of the Rabbi Ishmael. Uh, which is, these are written down around the second century. They may reflect much earlier thinking, but this is things that are being written down around the second century. Okay. So on the same verse, right? Anachi Adonai Lehecha, I am the Lord your God. Lama Nemar, what does it say? So, um, Ruth, you want to read for us this paragraph here? I am the Lord your God. Why is this said? So the sea he appeared to them as a mighty hero doing battle as it is said, the Lord is a man of war. At Sinai, he appeared to them as an old man full of mercy. It is said, and they saw the God of Israel, etc. And of the time after they had been redeemed, what does it say? And the like of the very heaven for clarity. Again, it says, I look until the thrones were placed. It also says a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, etc. Okay, so what's the problem that, that the Midrash is identifying here? How do you describe God? How do you know God when you see God? Right? At Sinai, what does God look like? No, no, no. An, an old man full of mercy, just looking at our text oh, here, right? Oh, oh. And, uh, and at the sea, how does God appear? As a mighty hero. As a mighty hero, man of war, right? So is it possible that these could have been different gods, right? If I see this mighty man of war and I see this merciful older man, I might think those are different things. So what the Midrash is suggesting, or I think working towards, that to say, no, 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 you may encounter God in different ways. So God has to say, yeah, but I am the Lord your God. All of this is me, right? Read the rest of the paragraph and we'll see if we're right. So as to ensure the nations of the world do not claim that there are two authorities, the Torah states, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who was in Egypt and I am the one who was at the sea. I'm the one who was at Sinai. I'm the one who was in the past and I'm the one who will be in the future. I am the one who is in this world and, and I am the one who will be in the world to come. As it is said, see now that I, even I am he, etc. And it says, even to old age, I am the same. And it says, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Okay. So this is the function of Midrash here. It's, what, what's the crisis? The crisis is God seems to behave in very different ways throughout the Bible. And the second crisis is in the Ten Commandments, the first commandment has no command. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. There's no command there. Have a, no other gods before me. That's the second commandment, right? So you need a, some kind of a reason. Why is God wasting our time with this self-introduction? Answer, because wants to, God wants to clarify there's only one God, lest you should think, right? You know, if you... It's, it's like, uh, I don't know if you're comic book people, right? Okay. Superman, Clark Kent, <laughs> same person. <laughs> yeah. Same person. Lois Lane is married to them both. Okay. Just sometimes it appears as one, sometimes it appears as the other, but it's always the same guy. You just have to clarify. You just have to keep that in mind. 
also think to think in ancient times there were always different gods of different mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. back then, if you saw it's true. one particular action, you said it's the god of this, and something sure. else happened, it's the god of that. And Judaism is different right. because it's saying there's one god. Our, our, our god of love, and our god of fertility, and our god of thunder, and our god of uh, vegetation, same god. You know? Many jobs. Many hats, one head. Okay. Okay. So, it is there to help harmonize our understanding or continuity of God, right? And you see, it's adding something, right? Now, is this exegesis or eisegesis? Okay. That's eisegesis. <laughs> Neither of them have to do with Jesus, Jesus, but <laughs> okay. so, and I can't spell it. G-E-S-I-S, perhaps? Okay, exegesis, I have a text, I read the text, and I say, oh my god, this is obvious, and I bring it out. Eisegesis is, I have this idea, and look, I can find proof for it in the text. Oh. So, hmm. exegesis is the text is telling you something, and eisegesis is you're telling the text something. Oh. So, the best example of eisegesis, the Christians love eisegesis. The best example of eisegesis is, uh, and the, when God was creating the world and the spirit of God was fluttering over the water, don't write spirit. Right? Capital S spirit. The Holy Ghost. Okay, that's reading it in. So eisegesis is reading concepts in that are not there. Exegesis is reading out concepts that are not there. In both cases, the concept's not there. <laughs> but the process, but, but here it's eisegesis of, uh, is I've got an idea and I'm trying to find proof for it. And you can find proof for it. Um, exegesis is I'm looking at the text and I bring the proof out. Uh, a similar example. Huh. My Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai. You've seen that, right? It's not in our prayer book, but in many prayer books. And in the Torah, the ayin is big and the dalit is big. Okay? What's the classic reason that we were taught in Hebrew school why the ayin is big and the dalit is big? If you put the ayin and the dalit together, it spells end. It means that we are supposed to be witnesses. So we are a deem for God. We are witnesses for God. And whenever we say Shema Yisrael and Nailahino and Nailahino, we are proclaiming God's existence, right? That's an explanation. What kind of explanation is that? It's eisegesis, because <laughs> I mean, maybe that's, you know, maybe. I mean, it could be exegesis, but I, the text doesn't have to go there, right? On the other hand, it's not strictly speaking eisegesis or exegesis. It's more speaking interpretation. What is I? What's special about I? Hebrew 101. I? You are you? It's a silent letter. Good. What's the other silent letter? Okay. What's special about the dollar? Which letter do you mistake it for sometimes? Which? Okay. What 
אומרת את זה פייסי שמא ישראל אדוני אלוהינו אדוני אחר? Perhaps, O oh Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is another. Would that be a terrible mispronunciation of that verse? Perhaps, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is another. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? So we better put a huge doll in so that you get, don't make that mistake, and a big I in so you don't make that mistake. But Midrash is more of the aid type thing, the witness one. Okay? That's more Midrash. Let's look at another text. It continues on, you should have no other gods before me. Right? Here we're going to have two different uh, Midrashim here. So you should have no other gods before uh, me, uh, Helene. Um, why is this written? Since it is written, I am the Lord your God. This can be compared to a human king who entered the country. The servant said to him, decree upon them decrees. He said to them, no, when you will accept my rule, then I will decree upon them decrees. Uh, because if they do not accept my rule, they will not accept my decrees. Similarly, God said to Israel, I am the Lord your God, and do not have any of other gods before me. God said to them, I am the one whose rule you have accepted in Egypt. Is that right? They said to him, yes. God continued, so just as you accepted my rule upon you, accept my decrees, and shall have no other gods before me. Okay, let's unpack that. What's going on here? What's, what, what, is the, what is the problem in the text? Rabbi? Yep. If there's only one God, yeah. why does it say you should have no other gods before me? Why not just say, I am the only God? Bingo. That's it. I've always wondered That's that. the problem with the text. <laughs> always wondered that. Now, um, an academic answer would be because biblical monotheism isn't monotheism as we imagine monotheism, and that Monotheism, as we have it nowadays, is something that was imposed onto the text around the time of King Josiah. But that's that's more of an academic answer. Um, but it does raise a question. Why does it say, you know, you should have no other gods before me? So here they're reading in the question of, you know, if you come new to the country and you're leading them, right? We had a choice to choose gods. We had choices out there. We could choose our God or we could choose the false gods. God did stuff for us. We said, okay, we'll accept you. Well, if you accept that, if you accept me, then the corollary of that is you can't have any other gods. Right? Again, it's making it into a, a conversation. With me so far? Okay. <laughs> so Compare that to a different notion here. And this is from the, the, the Talmud, uh, Shabbat 88a. Uh, Milt, you want to share for this? Yes. And they stood under the mountain. Ar Abdemi de Hanama de Hasa said, This teaches that the Holy Blessed One turned the mountain upside down over them like a barrel and said to them, If you accept the Torah, that is good. And if not, here is where you will be buried. Okay, you ever hear that, Mitra? That's only voluntary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Very enticing. So, uh, gee. So here's two versions of you shall have no other gods before me. Version A, I did for you in Egypt. Version B, or else. <laughs> so the idea is here's the people, and here's the mountain turned upside down like a bucket over them, and God will drop it on them if they don't accept it. This actually really troubles the rabbis, 
right? Because there's no consent here, right? Because that, that's duress. Do you know where they find the solution for the duress aspect? In the book of Esther, it says, and the people accepted upon them the laws that, that Mordecai was sending them. And that's the voluntary part. And that was retroactive to here. Right? In, in the Shema, it says, if you accept me as your God, uh, you will have plenty to eat, rain, and due season. But if you don't, then there are consequences. Right. It implies, the it, it implies there's an alternative. Right? But the alternative isn't good. Nobody no. wants the alternative. Well, so I guess, I guess you can't renege on a deal once you've done it. <laughs> right. So when it says, have no other it's gods so before me, <laughs> you have no other gods before me, that can either mean because you made an agreement, in Egypt, or it could mean or else, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You also kind of take it that God seems to, seems God, to me, God has an understanding that not everybody's going to accept him, that they're, you know, they're, they're you know, there will be people accepting other gods before God. Yeah. And those people are wrong and they'll die. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. But to me, that's, you know, that's like human nature. You know? Yeah. I mean, some people are going to believe and follow and others aren't. And like, I, to me, it's like God is acknowledging this. Right. There's, there's different levels of God's confidence uh, in these texts. Right. So, so how do you... Uh, put this in context with the fact that Jews are a minority in the world. There are many other disbelievers. <laughs> Why aren't they dead? Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, that's sort of a, a digression, but I think <laughs> I can do that in enough time. Our God is not the same as other gods. Other gods in every other religion, everywhere, the gods are born, they have lives, sometimes they die, they have personal narrative, and they're limited. In the Greek system, what one god, what one god says, no other god can undo. And within all systems, you know, the Norse gods, the, the Greek gods, the other gods, they are subject to and bound by fate, which is beyond them. And they're bound by destiny, which I guess is the same thing, right? And fate terrifies them, right? Our God is fate. Our God is that higher power that has no beginning, no end, and encompasses everything. So really, our understanding of the system is, there's our God who rules the universe. And God is created in this universe, lesser gods who have actions to do. Also creates angels who has actions to do. Also creates reality. Most other people worship their local god because each country has its own god, right? And each god of each nation only has power in their own nation. So the gods of Assyria don't speak up in Egypt. And the gods of Egypt don't speak up in, in, in Assyria. By the way, our God never speaks to us in, in Egypt either, right? God speaks to Moses at Sinai, which is outside of Egypt, right? But the great God, was there another God who went and took a people for God's self? 
out from another nation and made God's own. So we have a special relationship with God, right? The relationship between God and the rest of humanity is they have seven mitzvot. Uh, don't murder, don't steal, um, don't eat things while they're still alive, uh, sexual immorality, kidnapping, um, you have to have a set of, uh, of government. Whereas we have 613, which is 608 more than them. And the reason we have these 613 is we're supposed to be a memlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh, right? Memlechet is a kingdom. Memlechet kohanim, what's kohanim? Priests. Kingdom of priests. And a goy, what's goy? Nation. Nation. Kadosh. Holy. Holy. We're supposed to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, we're supposed to stand in the position of priest to the other nations. Now, priest is like your coach, right? Now, I saw the football, I saw the Super Bowl, and what I'm going to say does not apply to the Super Bowl. Okay? But at the high school level, if you're on a team, who should be the best person with the best skill set on that team? Quarterback. The coach, oh. <laughs> the coach, because the coach is the one teaching everyone else. The coach is held up to a higher standard, <laughs> okay? Certainly your math teacher should know more about math than the students, right? So we have a higher standard so that we will be exemplars, that we will be an example because the 613 that's what make us better people. And that will make us a light unto the nations. So in this system, that's how you understand don't have any other gods before for me. It's like, don't mistake the gods that I've created as being equivalent. Don't think that, don't elevate the angels to godhood. That's this this way of looking at the universe explains how Judaism can exist in harmony with the fact that everyone else isn't Jewish. Because they're just misguided. Although some of them worship the great God, but with under a different name or a different understanding. But this can also be interpreted as arrogant. Right. Well, it's arrogance, but not, not as arrogant as most other religions, because Judaism says that we have a truth. The other religions say they have the truth. And in the other religions, if they have the truth, that means everyone else is wrong. True. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Catholics don't think the Anglicans are really Christians. Okay? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just wrong. Okay? And all, all the, all right. Whereas we have our truth, which means that other people have another truth. And that's fine. That's their truth, and they can do it. Well, this is our truth, and we do it. Rabbi? Yep. It seems to me that the equalizing factor is that you don't ha you must be a good person, and you don't have to be Jewish. Yeah, that's right. If you follow those seven mitzvahs, you are a righteous person. You have a place in the world to come. Right? Okay. That was a good digression. Got some theology there. One last uh, bit of midrash to look at. We're still on 
<laughs> We're still on. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. Okay? Yeah. So, Jack, you want to read for us? Uh, I'm the Lord your God. Rabbi Levi said that the Holy Blessed One appeared like one of those icons which has faces everywhere. A thousand people can look at it and it looks back at each one by the same way. When God spoke, each individual could say, the speaker is speaking to me. He does not say, I am the Lord your God. With you in the plural, it says you in the singular. Right, and he's right. It says, Ani Adonai Elohecha, not Elohechem. Right? I'm not the Lord, I'm I'm the Lord thine God, not 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 your God. Okay? Speaking to each of us individually, but in the plural. Okay. Uh, Rabbi uh, Yossi Bar Hanina said, God's speech came to each individual according to their capacity. Do not be surprised at this. When the mana descended for Israel, each person tasted it according to their own capacity. Infants tasted it according to their capacity. Young according to theirs, elders according to theirs. To infants according to their capacity, it tasted like their mother's milk. As it says, it tasted like rich cream. To the young, it tasted according to their capacity, as it says, my bread, which I gave you, bread and oil and honey. The elders, to the, uh, to the elders, it tasted according to their capacity, and it said, taste of it was like wafers made with honey. In the same way as the mana tasted in each person's mouth according to their capacity, so each individual heard God's speech according to their capacity. Okay, so this is riffing on your God, your singular, right? If God's speaking to the whole nation, to everyone, why is God saying individual? And this is the notion that, okay, to each individual, her, here's their own version. Um, if you want to have a different take of that, it's like having someone speak, but each person hears them in their own language, right? You hear it in Ukrainian, and you hear it in Russian, and you hear it in Greek, and you hear it in Hebrew, and you hear it in English but just the one voice talking. You just understand it in your own language, which I guess is something that God could do, right? Kind of like music, right? I, I, I hear music in, in English. I like that like individualism. You know, yeah. The individual is recognized. Right. Which is probably also tr not so right. true in other religions. So what have we learned about God? Um, you know, this notion of tasting God in different ways. Well, what have we learned about God in our exploration of, of, of Midrash? Well, if God has many faces, he's introducing, or God is introducing God's self, I have different dimensions, and to each person, like we just read, we have different interactions with God depending on who we are, mm -hmm. maybe who we are at a particular time, you know, thinking about personal growth, that sort of thing. But, you know, just as God has many aspects or faces shown at different times, depending on the circumstances, but that's all God. And we each have different relationships with God, maybe depending on a particular time in our life or experience we're having. Um, you know, it's not just one thing, it's multiple things, but that's all part of the whole. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts on this? In, in literature, God is a complex character, right? We, we want to make God two-dimensional, kind and loving and this and this and this, and, you know, hold it up. But no, God is infinitely complex, uh, indescribable, meaning you can't, you know, once you start to describe your, 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 making your obfuscating, your obfuscating as you do that, right? You know, just by defining something, you're limiting something, mm -hmm. and you can't limit the unlimitable. 
And aren't we as, I mean, it's, again, as individuals, as human beings, it's the same, you know, we are also in some ways unfathomable, each mm -hmm. one of us. Right. But at the same time, we are limited. Um, if you ever oh, want to hear yeah. something fascinating, look at the cases of people who have uh, um, a kind of retrograde <clears throat> amnesia where um, it's not retrograde, it's, it's global something amnesia. Oh, and what happens yeah. is they can't remember the recent past, right? They remember the distant past, but they can't lay down new memories. And so you'll be in a conversation with them. And after about two minutes, they'll reset and go back to exactly where they were before. And it doesn't matter what props you give them. They're going to talk about the same thing every time. It's just an endless loop of always talking about the same thing. You can try to get them off topic, but they're going to get on to the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Which says that to a certain extent, we are, you could figure us out. <laughs> we are kind of programmed in a way. Just we only see the program run through once usually, so it doesn't bother us so much. Mm -hmm. But presumably God is not limited in that way. Okay, so that's a look at God in Midrash. Um, if scripture allows God to do ungodlike things, you know, like killing here and there and all that, um, Midrash allows us to humanize God and it allows us to um, find philosophical ideas, either proof for philosophical ideas or to generate new philosophical ideas from the text. Right? But it opens up a conversation with the text. And when you're engaging the text, <laughs> meaning in it, what you're doing is you are um, engaging with God in real time, right? We're not just reading about what God said. We're reading what God is saying to us now, right? In the same way that, you know, in looking at constitutional law at the Supreme Court, uh, some are originalists who say, no, the, the, the language is limited to what their, the founders intent was. And the other is that the language is limited to what the language, to any meaning that the language will bear. Meaning that our understanding can change over time as our understanding of language changes over time. Right? And we have the advantage of we can look at the original meaning, or we can look at the uh, current meaning, and we can decide which one is more meaningful to us. I, I think last time I talked about silly uh, England, yes. si si uh, silly Scotland, yeah. right? And we can talk about silly so Scotland as being Scotland is behaving a silly way, as a holy way, or we can talk about it as being demented, <laughs> right? Um, although, if I was going to talk about demented behavior that would have to be the rest of Great Britain and not Scotland. Because <laughs> Brexit was a just a wrong-headed idea for which they will regret. Uh, you know, at least at least they're no longer going to be angry at uh, um, Churchill for getting them off of the silver standard. <laughs> Rabbi, yeah, is it a mistake to humanize God? Isn't that lowering his stature? So to humanize God, um, it lowers stature, maybe, but it makes it relatable. We can relate to God as a human being. Um, we anthropomorphize everything, right? We anthropomorphize cars, uh, storms, uh, nuclear energy, um, emotions, you know, oh, the hunger has got me. The hunger wants this, right? Or the addiction wants this. Or, um, you know, the goal of the forest fire is to, you know, it's like we, 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 have, we put human emotions on everything. Why should God be any different? Because when we start understanding God in, in an abstract, 
it upsets people. You know, if I say, you know, this is what it wants, you know, you know, when God, when, when it was saying this, if I put God into an it, we get all upset because it's like, oh, that's not showing proper respect. But God is not a he or a she. God does not have gonads. <laughs> uh, God is an it. But once we start abstracting too far, I, I think we, we, we begin to lose our connection to, to it. And I don't know, I've always felt that one of the reasons Christianity is, is as popular or what, I don't know, it's as popular as it was 50 years ago, but as you know, uh, common as it is, is because there's a Christ figure. Sure, it's very you know, relatable. Like, we don't have that. You know, um, our notions are a little more abstract. And I really think that that draws a lot of people. People connect. Oh, sure. Right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Because uh, they go, they have a personal relationship yeah, yeah. with Jesus. They, yeah. Yeah. they tell you that. Yeah. 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 You'll see Jesus on the cross. And, <laughs> you know, baby Jesus. All these yeah. images, you know, and yeah. they get implanted in your brain. Yeah. And, and we say, no great, no, no. images. Right. So, yeah. Well, it, it, um, it is, God forgive me, it's a kind of paganism, um, but paganism has always been very popular. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, I guess it's what you're saying, the imagery. Right. You, you want to have, it's, it's, it's the God as a human being, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, interestingly, um, if you look at some notions of, of, of what God's presence is in ancient Near Eastern texts, it's not so different than the images that you have in, in Greek mythology or other things where the, the essence of God is something that's incandescently bright. It's a really, it's, it's energy and it's bright and it'll burn you if you get too close. The Greek gods clothe themselves in human form but if they show their true form, you go blind. And our God clothes God's self in first in a cloud, right? A cloud to keep. And then in the Mishkan, which is sort of like a portable cloud with walls, right? In the tent, like God lives in the tent because we are being protected from God. God stays in that tent and that tent stays in the courtyard we're not allowed in we're not allowed anywhere near that tent right because it is dangerous because it's got a geiger count it's radioactive but it's easier for us to understand god as a, as a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud or as an outstretched arm than to talk about you know the internet of things So that's that's God in Midrash. I think next time we are going to move a little forward on our uh, historical scale. Um, we looked at Midrash. Now we're going to look, next time we're going to look at God as reflected in halakha, in Jewish law, right? What does God look like as expressed on the page of the codes? And what can we learn about God from the way that we look at legislation? It'd be like a, a, a parallel might be if you had a course in American in America, and you could say, well, understanding America through fiction and understand fiction written in America, and understanding America through nonfiction written in America, and understanding America through American music and understanding America through American legislation and regulation. Mm -hmm. These are all different visions of America. None of them are sufficient. Mm -hmm. But if you take them all together, you get kind of a picture of what America is. Well, that might be a fun course. I could never teach it. But... <laughs> it certainly is bringing a lot of aspects together, but you're right, on college campuses, sometimes there's, you know, American literature or, Amer you know, versus the music and the whole, right. all right. of that. It's, and, and it's all interconnected. You, you can't understand Broadway 
without understanding slavery. Because without slavery, there would be no Broadway. Because without slavery, there would be no minstrel shows. And the minstrel shows is the origins of Broadway. But again, that's, that's, that's out of my field. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.